Dear advertising industry, it is April of 2022. The pandemic has been going on for two full years, and yet I still continue to hear the terms unprecedented times, trying times, new normal, in every commercial block of any television program or pre-roll ad. On behalf of, well, everyone, I am writing to humbly request that you please, for the love of God, stop. We are all well aware of the clogged toilet that this world has become and don't need to be reminded of it, or for our anxieties around said chunk-filled bowl to be weaponized against us in an attempt to take our dwindling reserves of money. And at the very least, understanding that weaponizing our anxieties is in general the whole point of advertising, it would be preferable that you could at least, you know, try to be original, use a different phrase, come at it a slightly different way, Allow me to make some recommendations. Instead of saying unprecedented times, perhaps something along the lines of post-decency years. Instead of trying times, try the excruciation hours. Instead of the new normal, how about the old abysmal? These are options I just came up with. Surely if you put all your 20-something junior copywriters in a room with a bottle of whiskey and a bag of edibles for a day, they could come up with something that would really sing. So with that, I look forward to hearing what you come up with. Good luck and happy flibbity flubity. Ooh, I'm going to keep that one. Signed, The World. These are the times that try men's souls, wrote American revolutionary Thomas Paine. Over 100 years later, British statesman Joseph Chamberlain said that at no time could he remember he had bought so many new objects for anxiety. Sound familiar? These days we're reminded constantly that things are bad. That we're living in troubled times, unprecedented times, times of the new normal. And I'm not here to say that we don't have any problems. We definitely do. But, you know, as Billy Joel once said, we didn't start the fire. Yes, I just went from quoting Thomas Paine to Billy Joel. Don't judge my journey. Uh, believe it or not, there have been worse times to be alive. Uh, and not even close, by a very long shot. So uh, today I thought I would take a look at some of the years throughout history that experts consider to be some of the worst years of all time. Now, there is one year that does seem to be the agreed-upon worst, but uh, let's start by talking about some contenders. Spoiler alert, uh, pandemics are going to be a bit of a theme on this list. The Black Death began in the 14th century when a variety of bubonic plagues swept through the Near East, North Africa, and Europe. Picture it. It's Sicily, 1347. A fleet of ships dock at the port of Messina, and everybody in town comes running out to see what was on the boat because, well, they didn't have internet back then. What else are you going to do? But as they get to the dock, they find out that the ship had some surprises in store for them. And uh, one of those big surprises was that half the soldiers were dead. And of those that were still alive, most of them were sick, bodies covered in sores called buboes in Latin, which is where it got the name. Now, they knew about the importance of quarantining at this time, but before they could get the quarantine in effect, the plague managed to jump onto the onlookers. And inside of a year, it was all over the continent. And by the time it had run its course, something around 200 million people had died. Now, for perspective, 200 million was about 30 to 50% of the entire European population at the time. Like, COVID sucks, right? I mean, we all know somebody who's died. We all at least know somebody who's very close to somebody who's died. But imagine if suddenly like half the people you know develop strange swellings and boils all over their body, started bleeding and vomiting, and then just died within a day. You'd be pretty freaked out, right? Well, people in the 1300s were freaked out too, and when people freak out, they tend to gravitate towards some of their worst impulses, like finding a group of people to blame. Throughout the Black Plague, attacks were levied at Jewish towns and neighborhoods, killing thousands of Jewish people. It's actually been known as the medieval Holocaust. Funny how a disease that kills Christians and Muslims and Jews equally is all the Jews' fault. So yeah, the Black Death is uh, about as bad as you heard. In fact, it probably was a little bit worse, and it reshaped the continent in a myriad ways. But the first outbreak can be traced back to that fleet of ships, which is why 1347 is our first contender for worst year ever. And speaking of ships, our next contender for worst year ever involved a group of people who uh, probably had them, because they were called the Sea Peoples. The Sea Peoples are one of the biggest mysteries of all time. Nobody really seems to know where they came from, but suddenly in the 13th century BCE, they just appeared out of nowhere, attacking Egypt, Palestine, Cyprus, and the Hittites. And whoever they were, 
according to archaeologists, they helped trigger the collapse of the Bronze Age in 1177 BC. I say helped because they were far from the only problem. In fact, they were kind of a result of some of the other problems. Like a lengthy drought in the decade before the Sea People's Invasion that drove them to, you know, raid other countries for resources. And a famine that had already raged across the empires that the Sea Peoples attacked, which made them especially vulnerable. The tomb of Pharaoh Ramses III records a devastating battle with the Sea Peoples. Uh, Egypt won, but they went into decline soon after. But the Hittites got it the worst of all. Its capital city was sacked and destroyed. It, they basically ceased to exist as a people. Another Sea People's victim was the Canaanite city of Megiddo. There are still ruins today on the Mound of Megiddo from that conflict, uh, although it's, it's not alone. There were a lot of battles fought over Megiddo over the years. This is actually where the word Armageddon comes from. Are you Armageddon it? And there was also the explosion of the volcano of Thera, also known as Santorini these days, that probably had a big part to play in the Bronze Age collapse. Ultimately, it was, it was just a perfect storm of disasters and conflicts that destroyed multiple economic systems all at once. Civilization was set back hundreds of years, and some empires were lost forever. And all of this started around 1177 BC, which is why this is a contender for the worst year ever. I've mentioned the year without a summer in previous videos, but it was mostly just in sort of a, huh, isn't that an interesting nugget of information kind of thing. Yeah, turns out it was a pretty traumatic event. The previous year, 1815, saw possibly the most powerful volcanic eruption in recorded human history at Mount Tambora in Indonesia. It ejected 180 billion cubic meters of material and may have killed as many as 90,000 locals. But that was just the beginning of the problem. There was so much ash from Tambora and other knock-on eruptions that the temperature around the world plummeted. The next summer was so cold that people actually froze to death in snowstorms. In the summer, and I'm not talking about like up in some distant part of the north. No, this is continental US. This snow and frost damaged crops and triggered famines across Europe and China. This destabilized society and riots broke out in England that came to be known as the Bread or Blood Riots. In India, the colder temperatures kind of flipped nature on its head and caused drought during the monsoon season and then floods during the dry season. This affected crops, obviously, but it also had the weird effect of causing a local strain of cholera to kind of mutate. And, and adapt to the flipped weather. And this mutation was able to bypass human immunity and cause one of the largest cholera pandemics of all time. It eventually killed two million people. All of that is a lot of damage for one volcanic eruption, but that's just how insane the Mount Tambora eruption was. And that's why 1816 is our contender for worst year ever. So far in this list, disease and disaster have played the largest role in making years the worst, but 1914 is a little different. What made it terrible was politics and war, which is like spicy politics. The first half of the year is pretty calm, uh, as things go. The biggest story really in the first six months was the accidental sinking of the RMS Empress of Ireland, which everybody seems to have forgotten about, but 1,012 people died. It's the seventh deadliest shipwreck in history. But yeah, that was the good part of 1914. Because in June of 1914, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria was assassinated. His wife, Maria, was assassinated too, but that's another little piece of news that seems to always be forgotten. He was assassinated by a terrorist, or freedom fighter, depending on who you listen to, who had the goal of uniting the citizens of Serbia against the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Yeah, Austria-Hungary had conquered part of Serbia uh, in the previous years. This is something that had kind of been boiling up for a while, but this assassination kind of set everything off and put both countries into war. Both called their allies to come help out, and within a few months, the whole world was neck deep in what we now call World War I. Over the next four years, from 1914 to 1918, about 20 million people were killed, up to half of them civilians. Tens of millions more were displaced and scattered about Europe, and this helped spread diseases. One particular wave of influenza became especially virulent and spread throughout the entire world, infecting half a billion people, eventually killing 50 million people. This was, of course, the Spanish flu, uh, which, by the way, didn't actually come from Spain, but all the other countries had sort of had an embargo on reporting on it, except for Spain. Uh, so since they were the ones that were talking about it, they kind of got their name stuck with it. Now, most of the suffering that I'm talking about here happened in the years after 1914, but it did all start from events that happened in 1914, which is why 1914 is definitely a contender for worst year ever. <laughs> yeah, we're going there. For 400 years, 1492 has been celebrated in American culture as the year that America was discovered. There is a contingent of people on this continent that see it differently. And we've all heard what a monster Christopher Columbus was, we don't need to go over all that, but some of the biggest effects of his discovery were completely unintentional. 
Because while yes, millions of Native Americans were killed in war and enslaved, um, that's just a drop in the bucket compared to the number of deaths caused by foreign diseases. The indigenous peoples of North and South America had been separated from the rest of the world for tens of thousands of years. And they had never once been exposed to things like smallpox, influenza, or our old friend the bubonic plague. So these diseases just went rampant throughout the population, killed millions of people. Various studies have said that the population decline is between 50 and 95%. And it's estimated that pre-Columbian populations may have been as high as 112 million, so we could be talking about around 100 million deaths. It's, it's just staggering. And the only disease that we think of that went the other way was syphilis, uh, which syphilis sucks, but it didn't have the same impact. I mean, in fact, Europe's population increased by 25% in the 100 years following Columbus. And all that growth required resources to support it, which the New World was ripe with and thus began the violent conquest of North America in earnest, which drove families, tribes, nations, and cultures to the brink of extinction. So no, they don't celebrate Columbus Day. And it's why I think 1492 should be a contender for worst year ever. But there is still one year that many scholars say is worse than all these. A year that's worse than the, the years that started the Black Death, the Bronze Age collapse, the endless winter, global war, and the near genocide of indigenous people. I'll start with an appeal to authority. Uh, this, this theory I'm about to explain is not mine. Medieval scholar Michael McCormick put forth the theory that the worst year of all time was 536 AD. And much like 1816, the culprit was a massive volcanic eruption. Actually, possibly two volcanic eruptions, according to some samples and tree ring data. It's thought that there may have been one in Iceland and one in El Salvador. Regardless, clouds blanketed the entire planet from Europe to Asia, and global temperatures dropped significantly. And they stayed down. Just as in 1816, there were summer snowstorms, crop failure, widespread famine, we actually have records of people starving in Ireland and China. And all this hunger weakened the population and caused outbreaks of disease, one of which would go on to become the first true global pandemic. This became known as the Plague of Justinian, and it did most of its damage around the Mediterranean and the Middle East, just destroying the Byzantine and Sassanid empires. It featured all the plague hits, buboes, vomiting, swift death, and it wiped out 40 to 60% of the population. It became known as the Plague of Justinian because Justinian was a Byzantine emperor at the time, and he decided while all this was going on, it'd be a great time to start a big old war. He was trying to reunite the Western and Eastern arms of the Roman Empire, uh, but he was super brutal about it. In fact, according to the court historian, he insisted that plague survivors paid the taxes of their deceased neighbors to pay for his wars. So famine, Plague, war, <laughs> running out of horsemen here. But this actually wasn't just a Mediterranean problem. Archaeological evidence points to the floods that happened in Peru around 540. It's not known if volcanic eruption had anything to do with this, but there was a large scale migration of the ancient Moche civilization, which abandoned their cities and just disappeared from history. And back in Europe, the economy collapsed for more than 100 years. It's actually kind of interesting how they know this. Uh, silver mining apparently leaves traces in the atmosphere, and according to ice core samples, there's a huge gap in the century following 536. So to review, 536 was a year without a summer that kicked off a period of starvation, plague, war, climate change, and economic upheaval. In other words, uh, trying times. But what was it like to actually live through the worst year ever? Like, did they know that they were living through the worst year ever? You know, as humans, with our limited lifespans, we have a hard time seeing the historical context of the times that we live in. You know, for the most part, we just keep our head down just trying to get through another day. But labels like worst and best depend on historical context. After all, one bad year might start a century of innovation. But I mean, let's face it, between the plagues and the famines and the floods, there's a high probability that you would have been affected in some way in the period followed by 536. And this is all levels of society. I mentioned Emperor Justinian's court historian earlier. He lost a wife, kids and grandkids to the plague. But he had no idea what was going on in South America. He didn't even know that existed. Whereas today, we know all the problems happening all around the world all the time, on top of the plague and now war. So I don't know, I think there might be an argument to be made that our current you know, communication infrastructure could be causing us to feel more of the anxiety and confusion and panic than in earlier times might have felt. So in that sense, <laughs> Maybe we actually are living through the worst year ever. But of course, those same communication technologies are making us more able to find solutions to these problems and innovate and adapt. Maybe that'll be our legacy. Look, the last few years have been not great. But, you know, when we look back in the decades to follow, when our descendants look back in the centuries to come with some historical context, I mean, maybe it won't be all that bad.
maybe these years will be seen as the catalyst that set off a period of radical advancement that put the world on a, on a whole new course. Now what that course turns out to be is up to us. So today we've got a new sponsor for the show, so say hello to Henson Shaving. Now hold on, hold on, I know you may be thinking, what, a, a shaving sponsor on a science show? But why? Well, I'll tell you why. Because according to my analytics, like 84% of you people are dudes. Hairy, hairy dudes. And the other 14% are hairy, hairy women. It's okay, you're a mammal. It's, it's supposed to be that way. But my assumption is, if you're watching this, A, you're a mammal, and B, you have places where you want hair and places where you don't. So, razors. Now, I know shaving is a very personal thing. We all have our own certain ways of doing it, rituals even, but let me give you a few reasons why you might wanna give Henson a try. If, you know, you're open to new things. First of all, Henson uses these single blade safety razors. And I know a lot of people aren't really familiar with these. They don't use safety razors. Most people these days use these cartridge things with like 50 blades in each one of them, thinking that obviously more blades means a better shave. But actually, no, that's, that's not the case at all. Cartridge blades are only supported at the end so they can flex and catch on hairs like you can see it doing with this playing card. A properly supported safety razor won't bend and flex, meaning less irritation and a closer shave. So how does Henson support the safety razor? With aerospace grade equipment. No, seriously. It's actually a pretty cool story. The company started as a little side project for some guys who worked at this aerospace machine shop that actually made parts for like the ISS and the Mars rovers for the last 20 years. And they put that same level of extreme precision into this razor. The blade is held at a perfect 30 degree angle and only sticks out at 27 microns. So it's supported all the way across. It's practically impossible to nick yourself with this thing. And I believe this is actually made out of aerospace grade aluminum. So there's no plastic in it or anything. This is made to last forever. And that's another reason to like Henson. They're sustainable. Like talking about plastic, look at these things. All the plastic in these cartridges and we just buy them and buy them and toss them one after the other and not to mention the cost. These can be up to $4 a blade. Even the cheap subscription guys are up to $2. These cost 10 cents each, and they're 100% recyclable, and you can get 100 of these things for free if you enter Joe Scott as a promo code when you check out. And they say you should replace these razors every five to seven shaves, so even if you shave every single day, you're looking at like 500 days, it's like a year and a half of free shaving. And then after that, it's only like three to $5 a year for blades. Seriously, I'm, I might do a whole video on what a scam these cartridge blades are, because seriously, an entire industry got us to pay $4 for something that should cost only 10 cents. That's a 3,900% markup. And we all just bought it. Plus it's just kind of cool, you know? It's kind of old school, kind of futuristic with the aerospace engineering and stuff. It's what Don Draper would shave with if he was an astronaut. Which is basically what Alan Shepard was. Shave like Alan Shepard. Anyway, everything about this is cool. I just got my hands on one myself, but so far I like it a lot. Super smooth shave. And yeah, if you're willing to shake up your shaving routine, give it a shot. Again, enter Joe Scott at checkout. You'll get 100 free razors, so you have no excuse. You hairy, hairy people. All right, thanks a lot to Henson Shaving for supporting this video, and a huge shout out to the Answer Files on Patreon and the members in our YouTube member section that are helping to support this channel, forming an awesome community, doing cool things. Let me shout out some new people real quick. We've got Crystal Matlock, Jack Ryan, Tara Daves, me, me, uh, Diana Darvall, Will Cooper, X Brit Morgan 3, Need to Know Basis, Stevie O. Nash, <laughs> Edsel Malisig, uh, Robin Green, Ariel Chi Kaplan, Jeff Miller, Nick, and Leo Vyuk and Right Mind. I think I got some of those right. Thank you guys so much for joining. If you would like to uh, join them, get early access to videos and exclusive live streams and whatnot, just hit the little join button right below this video. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, maybe check out this one right here that Google thinks you'll like or any of the others down the side that got my face on them. And if you enjoy them, I do invite you to subscribe. I come back with videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening rest of the week. Stay safe, and I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.